Hi, everyone. We're just a couple of minutes past the hour, so we're going to get started here. Uh, my name is Danielle Lund, and I serve as Associate Director of Digital Engagement for the Alumni Association at Mount Holyoke. Our work at the Alumni Association is all about creating meaningful opportunities for alums to connect. Uh, registered for today's webinar are more than 60 alums and students from 13 U.S. states, four countries, and representing seven decades from the classes of 1969 up through the class of 2021. Thank you for being with us today. For those who couldn't join, we're going to be providing a recording after the event. Over the past year, we've been focused on piloting industry-specific events like this one and are going to be continuing to expand these offerings. We encourage you to please complete our post-event survey uh, to share ideas on future moments uh, for the tech and innovation community. Um, it's, it's great to be here virtually with Valerie Barr, an alum of the class of 77, Jean E. Samet, Professor of Computer Science and Chair of the Computer, Desi Computer Science Department at Mount Holyoke, uh, and of course our alum panelists for the day, Exodia Demosthene, Class of 2018, Cleo Schneider, Class of 2011, and Benny Webster, Class of 2013, who will introduce themselves as we get started. The topic of industry culture is one that arose out of discussion at our initial tech and innovation uh, gathering in California in January. And so we wanted to create a space to keep the discussion going uh, and think critically about what shifts would be required for positive change uh, in this particular industry. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn things over to you, Valerie, uh, for participants who are tuning in with us today. If you have questions along the way, uh, please include them in, in the chat box. You can uh, access that feature at the, the bottom of your, your Zoom window. Um, and I'll be monitoring the chat box and we're going to focus on questions at the end of the panel. Um, so thanks again for, for being with us and now turning things over to Valerie. Great, thanks, Danielle. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, what I want to do is start, um, I think for the first question, we'll start back at the class of 2011 and work our way up. Um, I want to ask each of the panelists if you could briefly describe uh, where you work, what you do in your current position, and just a little bit about your journey from undergraduate to your current position. And we'll start with Cleo. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm Cleo. Uh, I use she, her pronouns just for everybody. Um, and I currently work at Google as a software engineer on the Firebase team. Um, and let's see. So I graduated in 2011, as it has been said already. Um, and right after school, I joined a small consulting firm um, and wrote, uh, wrote software for big banks. Um, and I took that job you know, mostly because I really liked the people that I interviewed with. Um, and uh, that was sort of a wild ride. Consulting is, is not uh, something that I, I think I will likely do again anytime soon, but it was a really good experience. Um, from there, I worked at Intuit, uh, which most people know for TurboTax. Uh, I worked on a product called QuickBase, which is uh, a database database. Uh, a, a what you see is what you get database tool. Um, and after that worked at a travel startup. So got to dabble in a little bit of startup life. Um, and uh, after that came to Google because I wanted, uh, I, I was a manager at that startup and I decided I wanted to get my hands dirty again. And so here I am. Great, thanks. And uh, Benny, what, what do you do and how'd you get there? Awesome. So I'm Benny Webster, um, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the class of 2013 at Mount Holyoke. Uh, currently, I also work at Google. Um, I'm based in on the West Coast in San Francisco. Um, I work as a UX content strategist. So UX stands for user experience. Um, and I work on the Google Play team, which for iPhone folks, that's the app store, but for Android devices. Uh, and I work specifically on products for kids and families. So my work entails a lot of learning design, advocacy work, um, helping tech people understand child development, things like that. Uh, so my path to, to tech was actually 
a little less traditional. I studied psychology and art history at Mount Holyoke, and then I joined Teach for America after graduating and moved to New Orleans and taught third grade for several years, um, and then really stayed in the education space for a while, went back to graduate school, and it was actually through my graduate school experience I took a class um, about children and media, and that's really what ended up being my path uh, into my role at Google, uh, working, working with kids. Great, thanks. And Exodia, you're up next. Hello, everyone. My name is Exodia. I graduated class of 2018. Um, after graduating, I stayed in Boston. That's where I'm originally from. And um, decided to just, you know, like see what opportunities were available, kind of decompress from the whole college experience. And um, later on that year, I joined a boot camp called Resilient Coders just to like refresh myself and um, get myself a little bit more active with my like coding and um, tech brain. Um, and then I started working at Wayfair. So I'm a software engineer at Wayfair in Boston and I am on the enterprise engineering team. So essentially we build apps and tools for all the employees at Wayfair to use as well as supporting talent management and relations development. Great, thanks. Um, I have to say, you know, Exodia was part of the first class that graduated after I came to Mount Holyoke in the fall 2017. So I, I have to think about the fact that you had to decompress afterwards. <laughs> um, all right, so now going in the opposite direction. Um, so we hear a lot about how bad the, the climate in tech is um, particularly for, for women and underrepresented minorities. And I was wondering if each of you could say a little bit about what your experience has been in the different positions you've held and also because some of you have been at a number of different companies, if you've seen differences um, across those companies, either maybe because of the kind of company or the size or um, the nature of of the work the company does. And so Zodia, we'll start with you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, this is my first like company that I'm working for. Um, and it's a fairly, I would say medium size. We were definitely growing and expanding rapidly in 2019. And that since has like slowed down and the, atmosphere has shifted a lot. Um, that's partly in, due to, you know, we had like a wave of layoffs and like that was my first time experiencing anything like that. Um, and also just particular to my company, like the time that I joined was such a unique time for its growth and development. So the way that, you know, I was engaging the space in that environment was very, I guess it was, you know, synonymous and like similar to the tech industry as a whole, but because of like this kind of like, you know, they describe it like a rocket ship and like, oh, we're, we're blasting off and, you know, everything's growing and expanding. Um, things were moving really quickly. And so when I first started, you know, it was more so of me just trying to figure out like what, what exactly is going on? Where do I fit in? How do I uh, utilize my particular skills and like find a place for myself in the in the general you know landscape and so um it was challenging for sure even if you just think about like the intensity and the pace and the pressure to like deliver and continuously shift gears and you know adapt to whatever the customer needs are and the company needs are that was like a very high octane high intensity fast-paced environment and so coupled with you know the you know industry's lack of diversity industry's lack of uh i i would just say sometimes i consider it just lack of like creativity and imagination to be honest um and for me i i mean valerie will tell you like i'm pretty vocal <laughs> like i <laughs> i try to uh you know speak up and advocate for myself in different spaces and so even when I was, you know, first starting off, we had a labs program where all the new engineers would come in and uh, learn the, you know, tech stack and work on different um, projects. 
And so, you know, for me, I had to really quickly figure out, you know, um, who, who can I count, like, who can I go to for support? Who can I go to, to uh, just kind of give myself a little bit more clarity? Who can I count on for um, advocacy? You know, being that I started in this cohort, you know, I was the only, I was the only black woman and I was one of four women in a class of 30. So, you know, that's like completely flip-flop from Mount Holyoke where, you know, I'm like all of the women. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, it was very challenging to kind of like have this, um, you know, dynamic where it's, you know, very skewed in terms of like diversity, but then also having to balance this like high paced, high octane environment where it's like, okay, I'm coming in and I need to do this work or I need to figure these things out. But I'm also feeling and experiencing all these things that are like very uh, either subtle or very stark in, in my day to day. Um, so with that being said, I think one thing that was uh, instrumental was just, you know, cohort building and coalition building and finding people that were like willing to spend that time um, you know, shift their perspective a bit and just hear about some of the different things that might impact our experience or impact the work that we're doing in a positive way. So yeah, that was like, I mean, that was my first experience. And since then I've been pretty much keeping up that same mindset of like, you know, finding out what are those things that are impacting uh, employees on the day to day and then, uh, thinking about creative ways uh, to solve or address those issues. That's great. Thank you. I, I think it's really interesting to have that perspective of someone who's, it's just been two years and, and not even that long that you've been at, at Wayfair. So um, Benny, you've been out there a little bit longer. So what's your experience been? Yeah. Um, so one thing I always try to remind myself is that I'm going to speak to my experience at Google, but there could be a person at Google has a very different experience being with the company is gigantic. Um, so my experience has been really interesting because I came from the education space. So the education space is extremely female dominated, is um, very empathetic, uh, very much about like, problem solving and feelings and things like that if we were to kind of generalize. And so the switch into the tech field was uh, somewhat startling, to be honest with you. Um, I wasn't, I, you know, I really had to learn how to change a lot of my communication styles. So I found myself, I had to learn how to be extremely assertive in meetings. I had to start interrupting people. I had to start stating opinions as though they were facts. Um, and that was really one of the only ways that I felt like I was able to like assert myself as a person who could be respected by some of the, the other folks on my team. Um, with that said, because I work in user experience, you know, the whole point of user experience is empathizing with the user of your product and like embodying their experience. So I do think that, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear what Cleo, Cleo has to say being more on the, the actual engineering side, but in UX, I have found that, you know, folks are generally really open to feedback and to having conversations. So one of the things that's really helped me is if I, this has happened to me several times where I go into a meeting I'm presenting my work and then I speak for maybe like two minutes and then it's just other people talking and it's like really difficult to get your point across or no one's really listening and things like that. And so I have found that people are really receptive to, um, I just try to call that out. You know, I try to really like explicitly redirect folks and say, hey, we actually have a goal here. There's more work that I've done that I want to show you. Um, you know, and I, I really had to like train myself. It was uncomfortable for me at first to feel like I was being so directive and, um, demanding I guess which I think is you know speaks to society's expectations about women and things like that but I just learned like that's the way that a lot of people on my team work and I had to adapt my styles to that but then I also try to call it out of hey you know that I had to kind of go out of my way to get my voice heard and like what can we do to create meeting structures or spaces where people don't have to be that assertive like you shouldn't have to change the way that you are in order to be heard or be successful on your team um so you know it's it's been interesting it's been really <laughs> really interesting. Um, the other thing I've really thought about a lot is, so there's this women in the workplace study that McKinsey and Lean In do every year. Um, and it's not necessarily tech focused, but I've really experienced this a lot in my job at Google, at least, um, which is that women are often given 
if, if a woman and a, and a man go and they give a presentation about their work, like a marketing presentation, um, the feedback that's given to the man is usually uh, like your numbers weren't high enough, you need to go fix your numbers or you're, you're, you, know, you need to go work harder, you need to go make, go talk to more people. And the feedback for the women is, is typically more qualitative and it's about, you need to think about how you're telling your story. You really need to think about your tone. You need to think about, um, you know, did, you know, how you're coming across. And I think that's something that I also have really struggled with um, in my position is, is, am I being interpreted because of like who I am and the way I'm seeing things rather than the actual facts or the work that I can, that I can show to back up. Um, my work and I think at least in teaching like I never had to deal with that you know like teaching was just like oh my gosh yay you learned two plus two everything <laughs> thank goodness um, so so it's been a really interesting transition and I think uh, I've definitely learned like a lot of skills that some are I think for the better and some are ones that I kind of wish I didn't have to have learned they felt like what I had to do to to make it I think that's it's a really interesting perspective and you know sort of that outsider view the anthropological perspective on the industry. So uh, Cleo, Benny opened the door for you to tell your story. Yeah. Your, you gave us your view. Yeah, um, so I've experienced a lot of different cultures um, and I'll, I'm gonna tell you the, the bad side. So, uh, so my first job out of school um, was for this consultancy. So it's the combination of tech and finance, which is about as like grossly cis white dude as you can get right um and so uh my first day on the job uh i started with one other person there were two of us this is a company with about 50 people and we went out to lunch with one of the uh one of the very senior members of the company and he sat us down and he said statistically speaking one of you will be here in six months and one of you won't um and that was that was my first day on the job, that was my first time meeting this person. And that sort of set the tone for me for that job, you know, coming from Mount Holyoke, which is like an incredibly collaborative, um, creative, thoughtful approach to computer science to this sort of cutthroat, like, you know, I j I'm just gonna name it statistically, one of you probably won't make it. So like, is that gonna be you, right? You know, um, and it was, yeah, I, and also just like being a consultant, you're also put in this position where you're trying to deliver whatever the client wants. And that leads to some really weird dynamics in the decisions that you're making in terms of the software and, um, and how, how fast you need to deliver it and what corners you're willing to cut to get there. Um, yeah, so that was a really, so that was sort of like Mount Holyoke, this like wonderful oasis to like, <clears throat> boom, like in, I'm just in it. And, and this is also, you know, a company where we did very public code reviews. Um, and that's like, that's something that's like, just, that's just common. Every software engineering company that you'll ever go to will do code reviews. Um, and this is a, you know, like before you're writing code, you're testing whether it works, maybe you're getting feedback from a professor, maybe you're getting feedback from a peer, but here now it's a public forum where people are going to come in and they're going to weigh in on the quality of your code. And it's not just that, but like your interpersonal relationships sometimes come out in that too. And there are people who, who think about that and who are very conscious of it. And there are people who aren't. Um, and I've seen the whole, swath of you know people who are really great at giving feedback and like people who really are bad at it and and just are very blunt and are not doing it for the right reasons and are trying to just sort of like take you down a peg um and so that was also like so i think there are those experiences really you know like right out of the gate sort of took i was taken aback and i was i had to really think about like wait a minute this is not this is not what I want to be doing, right? This is not the culture, this is not who I am, this is not the way that I want to work. Um, and so I eventually left that job, which was a really good decision. I, I will say that like, in terms of honing my technical chops um, and like getting me comfortable with what it's like to work in a production environment versus, you know, um, a, an academic environment um, is, 
it, it was really helpful. I learned a lot of really great lessons. I met a lot of really wonderful people, despite, you know, some of the uh, overwhelming uh, cultural touch points for this company. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I left with a lot of good lessons too. And so the next company that I went to, I was much more intentional about sort of what was I looking for in terms of the culture, um, in terms of, you know, the work-life balance um, and just sort of the values. Um, and one of the things that I really, so I interviewed at Intuit. Um, I interviewed at a bunch of places, but I interviewed at Intuit. Um, and the manager that I talked to was a woman. I was interviewed by women and the GM for the product, the general manager for the product was also a woman. Um, and there were people of color in the company, which is like, uh, you know, like, I don't think we can really talk about these issues without uh, talking about the intersection of, of gender and, you know, race and, uh, you know, uh, homophobia and all of that. And so just seeing the amount of diversity in my interview process uh, made me feel a lot more confident going to that company. Um, and as it turned out, all of those things proved true. I loved working on that team. I loved like the communication was much more open. You know, I think being part of a bigger company, there were a lot more sort of HR policies and things in place that helped, you know, <laughs> that helped people, you know, change, I guess. Because like here are a bunch of people who have also never worked in a company before and like need a little bit of guidance on how to be a professional and, and how to create an environment that works for a lot of different people. So uh, Intuit was like a wonderful company to work for um, and was starkly different from, from the first job that I, that I was in. Um, and it also sort of like showed me that there was a world where you know, I could be a software engineer, I could be respected, I could, you know, my thoughts and ideas would be valued, that sort of thing. And so that was really a healing <laughs> position for me to take. And it also really, um, it sort of pushed me to think about how I want to change the companies that I work for. What am I going to do in my day to day to make it better for other people to join? Um, and so I've sort of taken that forward with me in the, in the later positions that I've had. Um, and I don't want to take too much more time because I think I've, I've said enough about, about all of that, but um, that's sort of what I'll, I'll leave it with. So, um, you know, that was really interesting. And what I want to do is throw out to whoever wants to answer in, in any order. Um, you know, Cleo raises, some of the things that Intuit had done, obviously the diversity and in the interview process, but that, you know, we, what we don't know is, was it just that team or is that protocol across the company? Um, and then I loved your comment that they provided guidance for people who have never worked in a company before, because of course it's a whole industry that's full of, you know, this incredibly large number of people who are essentially are 22 and this is the first thing they've ever done and they don't know how to do it. Um, they may know how to do the tech, but they don't know how to do the rest of it. Uh, and so the question I want to throw out is, you know, sort of expanding on that. Um, what has to change most in tech to make it a better environment and, um, and to increase diversity, increase inclusion, to make it so 45% of women who go into tech jobs don't leave within five years? And do you think those changes are possible? What would it take, you know, not only what's necessary, but what would it take to get the tech industry to do those things? I'd like to take a first bite at that. Um, and for me, uh, throughout my experience working at this company, one of the most instrumental factors, and you see it so, like, it, at least for, for my experience, you see, I see it so clear, clearly, is um, leadership. You know, your company's leadership is super pivotal and instrumental to whether or not these things uh, happen. So uh, one thing that I'll say is um, when working at a company, find out, you know, who the CEO is, 
find out what uh, what their beliefs are and how do they disseminate these beliefs? How do they practice and incorporate these beliefs? Uh, when I started at Wayfair, you know, our numbers were scary, scary for gender, frightening for race. Um, and it was just, at first, I didn't really realize it. I like I felt it, but I didn't know until our diversity numbers were actually leaked. And I was like, oh, wow, oh, this just makes so much sense now. I'm really glad that I have some factual information to corroborate what I was, you know, internally feeling without realizing um, until those numbers were just made bare. And as a result, the discussion was initiated and um, we ultimately, I mean, this did not happen overnight. And the reason why I think leadership is so important is because, you know, you will see where your leadership stands on these issues. Uh, eventually, we did get to a point where we have now a chief diversity officer, which I'm not entirely sure is always the answer, as opposed to like, you know, just a uh, very, a very, I don't want to say like popular move right now, but it is a popular move. And, and diversity officers, the research shows they barely last. And the reason being is your leadership has to be doing that out of good faith and true intentional practice because you know what you'll see sometimes is oh the numbers are out we need to do we need a quick fix we need to figure this out let's get a chief diversity officer have this person solve everything but when they are then implemented or trying to make change they're always constantly you know facing this uh resistance and another thing that was highlighted throughout my experience is that you know, you can have as many grassroots operations as you want, but if there is no calibration or balance, you know, that meets the grassroots at the middle, then you're really exploiting a lot of the work that the employees are doing that is not being recognized, not being, uh, you know, compensated even, and that can impact your performance, your confidence, everything. And so leadership, responsibility is to set that tone and to also provide the framework and to also invest in the work. Um, you can hire a chief diversity officer all day, but if they have no funds to then build out their own team, if they have no budget to then implement these programs, what are we really doing? Um, and then the final point on that, I would say is, um, you know, people naturally want people who are like them and to work with and to you know build with and collaborate with and so when you have leadership that is consistently uh promoting and and reinforcing this heteronormative or you know homogenous you know narrative in tech you're fighting a losing battle i really hate to say it like that but you need to really find leadership in a company and a, and a CEO, someone you can, you know, listen to speak and not feel like, man, I got to find a new job tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I've heard some CEOs speak and it was, you know, it was go time. I'm sorry. I have no confidence in your intellectual capabilities, let alone, you know, building out a sustainable, healthy, dynamic and environment for people to thrive of different um, backgrounds, so. Great, thank you. Benny, Cleo. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd love to, to build on that. I think you're so right, Exodia. Like I, I you know, I think we need leadership that, that cares about it um, and that is going to implement changes at a policy level. But I think even more than that, we need sort of a, a consciousness raising effort right, that we, you know, that, and, and I think we've seen movement, like there's certainly in my career, there has been movement in this regard. Um, you know, at Google, I think they do a surprisingly good job of like talking about unconscious bias, talk, you know, talking about how you should reduce bias in interviewing, in, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of all of the other, um, I think primarily in interviewing because I work a little bit in that space. Um, I'm involved in mentorship and recruiting and uh, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts um, at Google Cambridge. And um, it, it's, I think the, the fundamental problem here 
is that the people in power have a lot of privilege and they don't need to think about it, right? Like at the end of the day, you know, if they're, you know, if the company is super successful, diversity is an afterthought. Um, and so it has to become the problem of the privileged. And, and that's like, that's not just in tech, that's everywhere, right? But, um, and so I think we need to, you, we need to spread awareness. We need to get people talking about it. That's one of the things that like, I, you know, try really hard to just name it, just like start naming it every time I see it, you know? Um, and I think Benny was talking about this too, just saying like, hey, you interrupted me and I've got a lot more stuff to talk about. Um, and finding, uh, finding people who are, who are like you to start working with. And you know, pro, you know, bringing up these voices and promoting them and getting them into positions of leadership. I think until we have better representation, um, you know, it's going to be this like we're going to have like, yeah, we're making progress. No, we're not making progress. Yes, we're making progress. No, we're not making progress. Right. Um, and I think we need some examples of the way that diverse companies succeed and just you know, really crush the competition to show that that is a model that works, right? We have all of these models of like, you know, anti-social white dude genius makes an amazing company, right? And we, and like, that's the, something where people now feel very com like comfortable being that person. That's something that some people aspire to. And we need that to not be the goal. That's not the goal. Um, so that's, that's what I think needs to change. All right, Benny. I agree with everything. Am. Well, yeah, I was going to say, like, I could plus one all of this. Um, I, there's two key things that I, like, really think about that I could add on. So the first is, I agree. I think, at least at Google, I think there's a lot of work going into these things. Like, generally across the company, there's really intentional research-based effort that's happening, which is admirable. It's still so slow like it is moving so slowly. So it's like people are working on it, but it, I, we really need some like radical decision makers and people who just aren't afraid to say like, mm, I'm coming, you know, I'm going to come in here and kind of like F stuff up for lack of a better phrase. To, like we need some of that radical change because I think what's what the norm is, is now like, okay, we know it needs to be, be better. And right now we're just comfortable with the improvements happening very slowly and incrementally. So they don't make people uncomfortable. And like, we just, people just need to be more uncomfortable because it's just taking forever. So like the thing I think about a lot is like, at least on my team, it's pretty diverse, like across any way, any way you slice it, race, class, gender, sexual identity, whatever it's at the, at the lower levels. And then the minute you move up to like manager level, it's like, pfft, and then the minute you move above that, it's just like completely drops. And that's, that's like, that's where the, to your, both of your points, like that's where the change and the radical decision-making is the most impactful and like where it really needs to happen. And so I do think there needs to be more manager training on, on helping the lower level folks feel empowered and like also identifying those individuals who might not be adhering to like the typical expectations for like tech work behavior. So like people who maybe aren't just like burning themselves out at like a rapid pace just because everybody else is or people who aren't loud and bossy or whatever you want to call it and, and actually like identifying those strengths and bringing those people up without asking them to fundamentally change the way that they are as people. Um, and then the last piece is I think there's a lot of resources out there, but they're really only there a lot of the time for the people who are looking for them. So people like, you know, us. So like, great, Google has all these resources if you choose to decide you're interested in learning about the thing. And so I think a lot about there needs to just be more intentional, consistent, professional development for people that is not just based on what you're interested in learning about, but is actually something that's like required at a pretty consistent basis. Because, um, you know, otherwise you just continue to only look for the people who you like and you only know the things that you know and you're not aware of, of all the other issues that are going on or ways that you could be doing more impactful work. Right. Um, so, um, so the job of the moderator always, I think, is to have the question that you didn't know about ahead of time. Um, and so, so the question I want to ask is... Um, 
what you've all laid out is that the lasting change is going to happen because of leadership commitment, because there's going to be a change of management levels, and so there's going to, because of that, there will be influence coming down. But I'm looking bottom up because I'm training those eight, those 22 year olds who are going to go into those jobs. So what could we be doing? What should we be doing at Mount Holyoke to help better prepare our students to, to be able to go into this landscape, which is very imperfect and be able to navigate it and thrive um, in the early stages of their career before they become those managers who help to make the lasting change. So this might be happening. I graduated a while ago and I was also in the psych department. So like, just forgive me if you're like, we do this already. But, but the thing I think I really struggled with and I continue to struggle with, and I get feedback on a lot is like, I feel like sometimes I'm, I feel like I'm always trying to prove something to someone and it's, it's really easy to burn out. Like it's just, it's so, it's so easy to burn out and that's not good in the long term. So I wish that earlier on I had understood like it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> um, that, you know, like just better understanding the balance of how to like show up and really do a good job and hustle, but then also like maintain your, your well-being and your, um, your boundaries um, and your emotional health. I, at least for me, I, I find work to be emotionally super draining beyond just like it's intellectually interesting and complex. It's also emotionally really draining. Um, and I, I wish I had understood a better foundation of how much that's a part of the career. It's not just about the technical skills or the, the navigating people and getting promoted. It's also about like sustaining yourself because we need people who can sustain to that manager, that director, that CEO position. And you're not going to sustain if you're in there just always trying to fight people and prove things, which is kind of what my approach was at first. Um, so I think any ways that we can have discussions about that and think about building up those resilient skills early is, is like really, really foundational. I'd like to really add on that, Benny. I think what that, you know, boils down to or what that can look like is, as you said, Valerie, we're training these you know 22 year olds and fundamentally we need to start rewarding different behaviors um the classroom is a breeding ground for a lot of the dynamics that you will see persist in the tech economy and the tech industry um as someone who graduated recently i can say you know some parallels persisted some did not and you know looking at and analyzing what are the subtle behaviors that are rewarded in this current dynamic? Is it uh, behaviors that encourage you burning out? Or is it behaviors that encourage more collaboration and more advocacy? And, you know, we really need to be training warriors. Um, that might sound a little intense, but when you get out there, it isn't Mount Holyoke. It isn't milk, MNC's milk and cookies. It, it isn't a Laurel Day Parade. It is a real situation that has real life implications for your physical health, mental health, and emotional health, as well as your financial well-being. And so how are we in the classroom preparing these student training warriors to get into that field? Um, the behaviors that we reward, you know, can, in my opinion, shift the, the norms. So we, we were competitive at Mount Holyoke. There's no shame in that. But being that, you know, I had some very unique uh, experiences. I did transfer and being in computer science, I was maybe one of two or three black girls in a classroom at any given point. And so you can see how we started in the classroom siloing or, you know, sectioning off and, um, not really incentivizing this cross collaboration or uh, finding those other skills that enhance the technical work or finding perspectives and ideas about how we can engage this technical curriculum with the attributes that are going to be necessary to survive in the tech industry. And so, I mean, I, can, I could rattle it off 
you know, the top of my head, but there are definitely dynamics and paradigms that we need to start shifting in the classroom that will persist and eventually challenge what the industry workplace looks like. Oh, <clears throat> last thought on that. All right, <laughs> last thought. I yeah, I think, um, I think it's sort of like there. There's a balance here between showing students what it can look like and preparing students for what it does look like, um, because you don't want to emulate this really messed up. <laughs> culture that exists in some companies and that, you know, more broadly exists uh, on a low key level. Um, I think, honestly, what I would, what I think was really valuable for me was I took a lot of gender studies courses uh, and I would encourage people to study social justice um, and like think about and know about the history of injustice. Um, and, and connect that, connect that to what exists today. Um, and, and think about all of the ways that, you know, you can be anti-racist, that you can be anti-sexist, to bring that with you when you enter a hostile environment, right? For lack of a better term. Um, and, you know, like, these are very stark terms. Like, it's not, it's not like that. It's, you know, like, if you, if anybody came to Google, it, you know, like there would be, um, you know, you would have a, a different, there would be a range of experiences that, and that different people have. Um, and I think the other thing in terms of um, preparing students for the outside world is to teach how to evaluate companies, um, how to look for signs of a company that has the values that you want, that is going to help you grow is going to support you, that has women in leadership, that has black people in leadership, that has Latinx people in leadership, you know, like get, find companies that are like that because they exist. They, not many of them exist, but they do exist. And I think getting pockets of people who are learning how to build software um, or build technology in that kind of way will own, then, you know, they will eventually leave those companies and they will bring it to a new company and they will have this foundation that is very supportive. Um, and so that, that's what I would say. That's, that's great. I mean, I think all of you made, made, you know, really wonderful comments and certainly a lot for us to think about. Um, I know that a couple people raised their hands and um, at least one of them was from the Career Development Center. So I think that we could ask, um, I'm going to let, I'm going to throw Danielle under the bus and make her deal with the technology, but I think that given what Cleo just said, it would be interesting to hear from Rashonda, who raised her hand early on um, in this and might have some thoughts on what Cleo was raising about how to evaluate companies. Thanks so much, Valerie, and just thank you to our panelists for your insights. It's just been wonderful to, to be listening uh, on this um, conversation. Um, so we're going to take questions via the chat box. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I also saw Ro R Rashonda's hand raised. So um, Rashonda, if you did have a follow-up question, if you can just denote in the chat box, that would be terrific. Um, I'll be keeping, keeping an eye on that uh, space uh, over the next few minutes, but we'd, we'd love to hear questions, um, comments, um, please enter them there and we'll raise them up. One thing I'll just add, because I do think sometimes these conversations can get like a little grim, and I, Cleo, you mentioned this, like, I have so much fun at my job. We reach a scale that's like really insane of, of ability to impact people. I have a lot of opportunity to innovate and try things, and I, so I just always like to remind people that, you know, like, yes, it's difficult, but for me, at least, it's something that's totally worth it, given the, the context. And like, for me, at least, like the number of kids and families that like we're able to impact with, with decisions that I think are really critical um, is exciting. And there's lots of resources, at least at Google. So there's a lot of opportunity for development, things like that. So it's not all bleak, but. <laughs> well, and I think that that's an important point. You know, I mean, I look back over a career that's now decades old. And what I remember most is, you know, the stuff I, the cool stuff I worked on in industry and not the people who said yucky things to me. 
Okay, I see a, a few questions coming through now. So we'll raise one up. How do you think that as a sophomore, if I don't get an internship this year, I can hone my coding skills to be more comfortable in the industry? I can take this one. Um, so I think that the major thing that you get from an internship that you don't get uh, in, like quite in the same way um, from, from uh, your, your classes is that um, you're responsible for this life cycle that of just like, here's a product, we're, gonna, we're going to make incremental features, we're gonna plan out how we're gonna do that, we're gonna roll it out and we're gonna get it in the hands of customers, right? And this thing needs to run forever, right? And I think that mindset is something um, that you only get when you start actually working with a company. So I think that to get that kind of feeling, I would find other students and I would try to build a thing together set up a GitHub repo, you know, set up, uh, you know, AWS, right, or Google, and like deploy things, get them running on a server that is in the cloud. Um, and, uh, you know, plan out features you want to do and just try and create that yourself. Um, because that's the kind of thing uh, that you get from working in industry is working on a team, working on product development, um, and working on this release cycle. Thanks so much, Cleo. Um, another question, how do you talk about fair compensation in the workplace for the tech industry? That's something that I think would also be great, Valerie, to help, <laughs> help students with. <laughs> yes. um, it's a, such a specific skill. I don't know if you agree, Exodia, like the whole negotiation <laughs> space is like really um, there's a specific way you approach it that like you, someone just has to tell you how to do it. And it, I wish I had <laughs> sooner. So, um, I was lucky enough to, you know, uh, the city of Boston was hosting a bunch of, uh, negotiation workshops for women. So I attended a couple, but, um, it's extremely intimidating on purpose. Uh, I mean, I've had companies say, uh oh, we don't negotiate. Yes, you do. Every, everyone negotiates, okay? Everyone negotiates. And so I think it's really important. One crucial aspect is to do your research. There are so many platforms now that share median, average salaries based on experience, based on location. You need to know what the numbers are before you can accept or advocate for a, a range. You know, there's a high and a low, um, and you should definitely do do talk to people um i know at my company there was this whole shift about you know transparency and compensation i mean people were out there just trying to get numbers aggregated it was it was intense because this is you know purposely obscured to ad, uh, put an advantage in the corporation's hands obviously but one of the key instrumental things that you can do is a find some of these workshop resources that structure how to have those conversations and b doing the research about you know what does pay look like for your position in your experience and then reaching out to folks who are in those positions who would feel comfortable um, sharing uh, some of that information with you. Yeah, one thing I'll add really quickly is also just don't be like, like ask for something that's crazy. The company can say no, like don't be nervous about like looking like, especially for me at Google, I'm like, I'm going to ask for something that I know is crazy. Like I'm not going to offend anybody and they can always come down. Um, but it took me a while to kind of realize that. So like also just advocate for things. People can say no to you. It's again, it's like, it's a two part thing. So I think that that really has helped me at least. I also think that uh, we do need to prepare students because negotiating for the large tech companies, it's very different than people going into other fields. So a CS student talking with their friends in other fields might have a very different sense of what goes on because they're not going to be thinking. If you're you know, a sociologist, you're not thinking about the signing bonus, the starting bonus, the stock options and all of that. Um, and so I think you're right that we do need to help set that framework. Um, 
we did have a student who's just graduating now who uh, did a whole session for the CS students this spring on um, how she negotiated with her, her employer. Um, and also I see that somebody um, mentioned negotiation topic and we did have an alum who did a workshop for students on negotiating. So that is an area that I think you're all right, we need to um, prepare, <clears throat> prepare students for. Thank you. Um, so I see a few more questions coming in here. For Exodia specifically, what was your experience at the coding boot camp like and would you recommend it? Sure. Um, so I had a great experience at the coding boot camp. Um, one reason in particular that it was very mission driven. So it was specifically targeted for a black and brown residents of Boston who are, you know, looking to um, just get in the tech industry and like, you know, navigate it. And so um, I was lucky enough to experience the tech space in a lot of different you know, ways. For example, Mount Holyoke being all women, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm doing, uh, I'm developing or I'm working on these problems with all women. Um, being in the boot camp, you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen a tech space in Boston that was predominantly Black or predominantly Brown people of color. So that was very instrumental. Now on the technical aspect of it, I think this also ties into the question earlier about, um, you know, different uh, projects that you can be working on. The bootcamp allowed me to build up my portfolio in, in very small, tangible uh, ways that would just give me something to talk about and show off and build from. So whether that be building like a simple to-do list in, in, uh, in a web application that someone could like type in, you know, on a URL and find and, and, and then be able to like play with, that is just, a really small tangible product that someone could see me developing from beginning to end. And then the way that correlates to my GitHub is that my GitHub was just super active. You were seeing daily commits, updates to different repositories. And so that green section was definitely, you know, attractive for anyone that is looking at the work that I have been doing. Um, and so I would just say that, uh, Definitely, you don't, you don't need a boot camp. Some of them are, you know, you gotta pay X amount of dollars, you gotta do this, that. I was lucky because mine was free and they actually provided a stipend. So that's not very common. And what you really need to take away from these boot camp experiences is developing and building your portfolio so that when you are preparing to interview, you have projects that you can say, I started from scratch, projects that you can say I got the boilerplate and added on or just collaborating with different team members. I think someone was saying, you know, get a group of people together and work on the projects. Collaborating in an environment that would simulate what you would be doing in the actual um, workplace. So all these things you can do on your own, to be honest. Uh, free Code Camp, Code Academy, there's so many resources that will allow you to build projects and um, get that experience without having to pay thousands of dollars for it. And I would just say, because there was also a question about um, if we're uh, helping students build up their GitHub portfolio, with the redesign of our curriculum, when students take um, software design and development now, they do use GitHub. So they are learning GitHub, but um, we, we don't have them put their class projects out into the public GitHub world, but they are learning it on an educational side. So then at least they have the GitHub skills to go set up their own portfolio as they do independent projects after. Um, and so I think that's a real improvement um, in terms of the curricular changes we've made. Thanks so much, Valerie. Um, I do see that Rashonda's question is, is in. Um, do you have any advice for recent graduates in particular getting ready to, to start their career in tech? Uh, I can start. Um, there, you, you just need to practice. <laughs> you really need to practice. Um, even now in, in my position, like if I were looking to, you know, shift or transition to a new company, I would literally set up a system of me 
going through different practice interviews. Uh, I've been working for a year now, so I haven't interviewed in a while. But that is a very key essential uh, place to gain your confidence. You know, don't go for that for the job you want first at, in terms of interviewing practice. Like start interviewing with other smaller companies or do the practice interviews. I know sometimes they have like mentors online that will come on and do a practice interview with you. Do these problems, work through them, and like just build up your your the ground that you're taking up with with the practice interviews because um, whether it's technical or behavioral, that is really where you're a you know selling yourself, but b gaining the confidence to ask the questions that will ultimately determine is that even a position or company that you want to work with or work for. So um, definitely just beefing up the beefing up the practice. Yeah, I would also say. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I struggled with in, my, in getting my first job is uh, this feeling that like uh, this, I mean, imposter syndrome, right? Like, I don't belong here. I don't, you know, like, I don't know enough to do this. I, and, um, and so I'll just say, and you can take however long it takes to internalize this. You do not need to know everything when you start this job. And it is not expected that you do. And I think one of the things that Mount Holyoke does best is it prepares you for learning new things. And that's really the skill that you're going to use most often is like, I don't know how to do this, but I do know how to figure stuff out. And so I'm going to look it up. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to teach myself. Um, and so I'd say that, uh, keep that in mind. You don't need to know everything before you get your first job. And your first job doesn't have to be the perfect job. Think about yeah. the skills you want to build. Think about, you know, where you want to be in two years, where you want to be in three years, and, and just start. Start somewhere. And if you're not getting the skills that you need or that you want that fit what your goals are, then think about how you will. Will you get it at this job? Will you take on classes outside of this job? Will you go to a new company? And all of those things are okay. There's no, like, right path so just start and you'll find your way so much yeah and really quick i'll just say i do a lot of hiring and interviewing for my team and the one thing that i always am interested in when i talk to folks is like domain knowledge is wonderful and we definitely like assess for that but i'm really really always compelled by people who are curious and who like really want to problem solve and who are flexible um, so much of our work is like not linear, like nothing ever goes the way it's supposed to. We're like scaling at really rapid paces. So I'm looking for people who have these like dynamic skills to just like can kind of, you know, be in an ambiguous space and like figure it out. And so I think also just figure out ways to communicate those skills in your interviews beyond just whatever your technical skills are, but also like examples of how you can kind of handle yourselves in these more ambiguous, uh, complex situations. Thanks so much, Benny. Um, we're, we're at just about time. Um, so I want to extend gratitude to Valerie, to Benny, to Exodia, to Cleo. Thank you so much for um, taking the time today to engage in this very important discussion and look forward to keeping up this conversation um, and continued tech and innovation, like moments to come together around tech and innovation. We so appreciate it.